Hello, I am delighted to be here today with Rob Jennings and Kat Edel of the Dyscalculia Network. This is an interview I've been trying to set up for ages and getting them both, getting availability from both of them is miraculous. And I'm so grateful they've been able to join me today. In this, <laughs> in this interview, we're going to have a good chat about dyscalculia. I'm going to be asking them about themselves and their histories and the networks of people that they work with in this field in the UK. I'll be asking them what they think dyscalculia is and how they work with it. Um, then I'll be looking at their advice for parents and teachers who are worried that their child, they, they're working with a child that's got dyscalculia. And finally, we'll be having a little chat about that really difficult question. Can dyscalculia be cured? So let's make a start. First question. Um, would you each like to introduce yourself? I'll let you start in either order and tell us a bit about your background and this network of people. Kat, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so my name's Kat Edel. Um, I'm a math dyscalculia specialist. I trained with an amazing um, person called Dorian Yeo back in 2003. So I've been doing this for quite some time. Um, I've worked in schools for children with additional needs. I've worked in larger schools. Um, and now I run my own business called The Little Maths Room, which is a tutoring business. Um, but through that, um, I discovered that there was a lot of people who didn't know about dyscalculia, who needed help about dyscalculia. And I was getting um, inquiries from all over the world. And through that, the idea of the dyscalculia network was born. And I met Rob through one of the UK's dyscalculia experts, Jane Emerson, and I wrote him in to help me create the dyscalculia network. Thank you. And Rob? Yeah, hi, I'm Rob Jennings from the dyscalculia network. And I'm quite relatively, compared to Kat, new to sort of teaching. So I've only been doing it for about the last eight years. Uh, I have a very dyslexic son who, uh, really inspired me to sort of like learn about the, uh, dyslexia, uh, dyscalculia. <clears throat> I was quite for fortunate to have met Jane Emerson, who Kat mentioned, because she's been the real driving force behind my development in terms of finding out about maths, learning how to sort of teach children that have maths difficulties. And as Kat said, we met a couple of years ago now and uh, the network was born. Really, um, what's lovely about it, if I can just add, is that Kat and I are completely different people, and we bring different specialisms to the network, and it's it's it's, it's a pleasure working with her. Thank you, Melissa. You're a good team. <laughs> so you both mentioned Jane Emerson as being an inspiration to you. Yeah. Are there other key figures who are around in this network? What is the network like in the UK? Well, um, we don't regard ourselves as the key, the only specialists in the UK. There's a whole plethora of different uh, specialists. And we, we work collaboratively with all of these different people that, we, that are uh, working in the UK. Um, you know, we've done a number of things, for example, with Steve Chin, who's uh, published a, a whole number of books on mass difficulties. Uh, and Steve's done interviews with us on, uh, he's helping us with uh, up and coming projects on maths, anxiety awareness, um, just to name one first, Kat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're in contact with um, Pete Jarrett, um, who is the current chair of the Sachs Dyscalculia Committee of the BDA. We're in contact with Judy Hornigold, who wrote the level seven course at um, Edge Hill University for um, teachers wishing to um, assess for dyscalculia. So we're just a tiny part. We're really the people who connect everybody together um, and network in order to get information out there. That's our main purpose. Okay, thank you so much for that context. 
So this question, what do you think dyscalculia is and how do you work with it? There's no universal answer to that, I know, but I'd be really curious to hear yeah. each of your perspectives or maybe there are, there are some communalities that you think are universally agreed. What well, do you think? Dyscalculia is, um, as we all know, it's got so many different uh, um, definitions, if you like, but we, I, well, I see it as kind of like the end of a spectrum of maths difficulties and where the most extreme cases fall into that category. Um, and the network's kind of focused on not just dyscalculic children, it's all of that sort of whole spectrum of maths difficulties it covers. Mm. Absolutely, because I think that um, the, the definition of dyscalculia can be a little bit fuzzy, even though we have a definition of dyscalculia as an innate difficulty with number sense. Um, it's also to do with many other aspects, to do with processing, to do with working memory, to do with um, a long-term difficulty in retaining information to do with math. And as Pete Jarrett always says, it, it's fuzzy around the edges of that because where exactly do you draw the line? And dyscalculia is so far behind in research compared to, for example, dyslexia that there's much still to learn about that. So I think what's really important is whether the child has um, dyscalculia or math difficulties, it's what we do to help that child and how we move them forward that's the important part. One thing that people talk about is whether a child with dyscalculia, is that a child that just has number difficulties and no other special needs difficulties or not? There's, not, there's lots of comorbidity between the different uh, special needs. Um, but again, I think kind of what we haven't mentioned yet is the, the key part of identifying what we need to do to sort of support uh, is the assessment. I think it's really essential to have a proper math uh, assessment done by a math specialist that will identify what the real weaknesses are and it could it, it obviously varies depending on each child um, so that we can put the intervention plan in place um, following on from that assessment. And can either of you explain how you do that? What does it involve for you? Well, um, Jane Emerson and I have written a new assessment which will uh, be really focused on identifying there's like 14 different sections to the assessment it's, it's kind of we're in discussion at the moment uh, with a number of publishers so I can't really say any more detail but it it does drive all of the sort of um, questions down into sort of the areas which mass specialists will be able to sort of identify and will show the uh, intervent the, the will sculpt the plan of how we uh, help that child because it's all broken down into the sp uh, respective parts that we we need to look at in order to do that and the reason we basically are, have written this thing uh, test new test is basically because there's nothing really that exists like it in the market there's lots of maths tests out there but there's none that really like digs into the sort of detail that we need to, to analyze a, a potentially dyscalculic child Thank you. I'm flagging immediately that when you publish that, I would love to interview you about that when it's out yeah, there in the okay. open domain. How about you, Kat? How do you assess a child? Um, so obviously, Rob and I work the same. So um, I'm, I, I've been privileged to already be able to use Rob and Jane's assessment. So I can't really give any more details, but it's going to be an amazing resource. And okay. really fantastic for teachers to use and I think it flows in really nicely to what I know is your next question which is how do you work then with a child you know an assessment is one thing but where do you move forward um, and I think that the most important thing any teacher or parent can do which comes under the advice I know as well is to get a child assessed um, and therefore they can find out exactly what's going on with that child where the child's strengths and weaknesses are and what can be done to help that um, and we build from that point um, by starting just under the point where the child is stuck. And I know that you work in the same way, Rebecca. We're looking to find out 
where in that Jenga tower the child is struggling. So I think of it, and I think this is a really good analogy if you know the game Jenga, which is all those little bricks that you keep putting on top of each other. And then you take some out at the bottom and you keep putting them up on the top. And in the game, your, your aim is not to let the tower fall. But what happens with maths is a lot of children have these gaps in their maths understanding, in the basic things that hold maths together. But in class, and especially for a child with dyscalculia, people keep adding to the bricks on the top without, and thinking, oh, they'll get better at maths if we teach them long multiplication, and we teach them long division, and we teach them fractions and decimals, when actually what they need is to go back and underpin these basic math skills that they haven't been able to get. And whether that's because the child has dyscalculia and a really difficulty in understanding number, or whether that's because the child has missed some school, has some difficulties because there's some comorbidity with other special needs, for example, whatever the reason is, we still need to go back and underpin that um, tower in a multi-sensory hands-on way that can help the child to see number. And I think that's the crux of what we, what the, the message we need to get out to parents. How low do you sometimes need to go in that tower? Can you? Oh, right to the start. So yeah. it can go back to counting one to 10 and understanding that one is one and two is two. Um, it, 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 it can be that way even for a 13 or 14 year old. Yeah, some, um, sometimes um, we see children where they don't understand the relative value of different numbers. Mm -hmm. So for example, you can put a giant number two up on the board uh, and also a number five uh, written normally and um, they'll see you ask the question what which is the biggest num bigger number and they will go for the number two every time so that whole understanding of the relative value of, of, of numbers and what a number means is you know crucial and it's very very common to see that yeah so we're talking about um, these children having reached teachers who don't know about these stages of development. So all those teachers, I don't think they're deliberately teaching the higher stuff because they think that's the best way oh. forward. They just don't know how to cope. Well, it, so, it goes, sorry, it goes back to um, the whole um, dyscalculia committee, if you like, the, the lack of uh, understanding, a lack of awareness of dyscalculia and the math difficulties. There's a real sense in the teaching profession, but also in, in the wider society about uh, mass anxiety. It doesn't affect other topics, but it really does affect maths. And it's, it's kind of almost, it causes teachers and also uh, pupils to shy away from the topic. And uh, um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of going, going on at the moment. So you're saying it's going on for the teachers as well as the children? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because the, the National Numeracy uh, and the Maths Anxiety Trust are doing a, uh, a program uh, next month, I think it's on in November, uh, where they talk about how this anxiety with maths is affecting the teaching staff in general, as well as um, the individual pupils. So when we're dealing with a child who's maybe about 10 years old and assessing them, I suppose there's different things that are going on here. One is gaps in learning. Two is maths anxiety. Three is lack of knowledge of the people surrounding them about what to do. But is there a fourth, which is physiological difficulties that a maths tutor couldn't help with? Do you have any thoughts on those at all? I know it's not really your domain, but if you've any experience, <clears throat> I'd love to. Uh, just from experience, really, um, I'm, I'm working with a, a young girl who had um, lots of pr problems when she was young with epilepsy. Mm. And uh, the treatment that they give, gave her at that time caused her to sort of some um, malfunctions and brain patterns. And I think uh, that this has affected her neuro pathways in terms of ability to do maths. And, um, you know, we, she was one of these pupils that couldn't understand the relative value of two numbers. And um, we've had to sort of peel right back. She's in year five now, and uh, she has made significant progress. But again, it's that intervention, knowing what to do from a math specialist 
to enable her to sort of build up the strategies that are different from you she might uh, have been taught in a regular classroom. I think when we've been math specialists for as long as Rob and I have been, you meet many children with different neurological conditions. I've taught a child who had a stroke when she was two, um, which has a big impact on, on, on learning. Um, I've taught a child with Turner syndrome, which has, again, is, is another um, syndrome which is well related, well known to cause math difficulties. Um, and I think that what our key is, is that it doesn't matter what, where the child is coming from, yeah. Whether whether the diagnosis is dyscalculia, whether there is another neurological condition, whether there's anxiety, with all of these situations, given the right support and encouragement, every child we believe can make progress. I'm not saying necessarily that every single child will pass GCSE maths, as if you want to use that as a benchmark, but what we're saying is that every single child can make progress and we can make a difference if they're taught in a multisensory, hands-on way that takes away the anxiety about learning is games-based and is fun. And I think that that's something that we need to move towards thinking that maths is fun and that we stop hearing Rob and I's least favorite sentence was, which is, oh, well, I wasn't very good at maths at school either. And, um, oh, maths, maths is just difficult because we need to encourage children to feel like they can do it. I think that's really important. I can see in your eyes, both of you, that you've, loved these experiences where children have been totally alienated from maths and by going back to the basics they've just switched on and started to really love it and identify their personalities with maths you can see yeah i mean for me it's been life-changing i i love helping people i love helping children and in a way i the, the more challenging the better really because you can make a real significant impact in their lives not just in the maths lessons because yeah. maths is all around us as we as we know and, and you know um, anything you can help in that classroom will help them in their wider lives which is fantastic. Just before we leave the physiological stuff and come back to the mathsy stuff have either of you come across children who are struggling to cross the midline in the way that their eye inputs are coordinated is that something that you've explored? Yeah I mean I've had some uh, tutees who've had specific medical interventions and exercises for that kind of yeah. thing. And it's clearly helped mm. as well. There's a whole kind of uh, area of maths, which is significant. It's the visual spatial um, issues, uh, left, right confusion. And that can manifest itself in simply by sort of flipping the, left, the numbers around so that the number three becomes an E and, and in its simplistic form. But um, it's also kind of when it comes to shapes and manipulating different um, problems in, in, in those areas. Uh, it's really important, as, as Kat said before, you, you try and make maths a little bit of fun, but also you do a lot of games where they sort of are able to sort of spot patterns and, and work on their visual discrimination. And we use a lot of different games for that. I mean, some on the network, we, we have this... Uh, regular shopping Saturday and we try to preview a number of games which not only are good fun but they also kind of help with that visual discrimination uh one we did last week was um, I don't know if I can say it online but it's the the new double game which is fantastic all of the classrooms are playing it and it's double specifically for maths so I'll plug that because I love it <laughs> can you just spell that for me d-o-b-b-l-e and it's yeah. uh, each card has only one difference and, and then numbers and uh, 2D shapes. So and where crazy. exactly could you viewers find that? Um, well, it's on, if you go onto the network. Uh, the Discalculia see, network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or one of our social media channels. Uh, and you can get it through Amazon, through, through the link from our site. But it's okay. really good fun. Awesome. So... Just before we leave this section on advice to parents and teachers on how to um, deal with these children, you've talked about what you do, and we've talked a little bit about there may be a physical diagnosis needed. Um, Kat, you mentioned get an assessment. How do parents or teachers get someone to assess their child whose opinion they can rely on? Um, at the moment, um, the Discovery Network has just started um, to list um, assessors and tutors 
Um, fortunately, several of these people now are able to assess for dyscalculia online. So that can take away the difficulty of being in a remote part of the UK where there isn't, hasn't happened to be a dyscalculia specialist next door. There is still a, a major lack of dyscalculia specialist teachers in the UK and assessors, um, but that is slowly changing. Um, and I would advise anyone to contact us at the network and we'll do our absolute best um, if we haven't got someone in your area to find somebody to help you um, online. Also, one of, one of the things also, we do. also um, sorry, Kat, um, educational psychologists um, mm -hmm. provide uh, a complete picture of the individual. Um, in our experience, um, they do a fantastic job of uh, analyzing and uh, dys dyslexia, but the dyscalculia part of their general assessments, and this is a huge generalization, please don't um, write in and tell uh, <laughs> psychologists to write in and have a go at me, but um, the, the mass part of the assessments that I've seen tend to be done at the end when the child might be a little bit tired uh, and the number of tests they do for the math side is significantly less than they do for the dyslexia side when they're analyzing an individual. And I think kind of that's a little bit unfair because it doesn't allow the proper assessment of that individual with regard to their abilities in maths. And uh, with, again, over the next period of a year or so, I think we will try to work with uh, educational psychologists to try and, you know, even that up a little bit if it's possible, because obviously they have a finite amount of time with that child and they're obviously doing the best they can to get a picture of that child overall. Um, but we'll be working in, with them to try and sort of help in, in any way format. And maybe the new assessment that uh, we've got coming uh, will help them to get the real detail, the mass detail of that individual as well. So. That's... Okay, thank you very much for that. So that brings us to our closing polemic question. Can dyscalculia be cured? It's discussed widely on forums. And I was in a conference session in the US where one of the founding principles of the definition of dyscalculia is that it's a condition that can't be cured. Um, and I'm just curious, what do you think? I think that if um, a child has a diagnosis of dyscalculia, and they do have an innate difficulty with number, then you can give them strategies and interventions to make a difference. But you have to bear in mind that underlying difficulty is going to be with them because that's what an underlying difficulty is, whether that's in, in any sense of our personality or our characteristics as a person, then we have an underlying difficulty. So I've taught many children who have a diagnosis of dyscalculia and I believe, their parents believe, they know they've been able to make big progress in their understanding and how they can function. But realistically, you have to accept that there's still going to be areas, for example, time management um, as an adult, um, that they're going to find difficult throughout their life. Um, and helping them to find ways to deal with that is part of what intervention is. It's not, it's not we're not asking to find a cure, we're asking to make a difference. And I think that's what any specialist in any field we want to do is to make a difference. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Kat, um, but I also think it goes back to the initial assessment to really get to details of that individual to find out you know, how far they are on the spectrum. Because a lot of our mass difficulties are, um, if you like, blighted by mass anxiety. And with the proper intervention, you can remove that, most of that anxiety to allow them to perform up to their potential. And by doing so, a lot of people, inverted commas, are cured. But that's one end of the spectrum, of people that kind of have the mass difficulties that can. But the people that have dyscalculia, as Kat said, it's an underlying condition that they'll be with them for the rest of their lives. It doesn't mean that they're never going to be um, uh, unable to do lots of mass related stuff. With the right intervention, the right techniques, uh, the different uh, multi-century way of teaching uh, will really help them to sort of cope with maths, become less of a stress, um, and they can uh, function in the maths 
all around us. Do you think the, the reality of overcoming the challenges that experiences of dyscalculia bring varies depending on the root causes? Do, we, do you think we know what all those root causes yet are? I go back to uh, the fact that when compared to, say, dyslexia, there's a huge uh, discrepancy in the, in the amount of research, the amount of effort put into helping dyslexic pupils. Um, I think maths needs to catch up on that. And I think, kind of, as Kat said, a long way to go uh, to sort of make things more comparable and lots more to find out. So lots more research um, in, in that field. Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you both so much. I feel like we've just captured a sort of moment in history in our understanding of this process. And if we have a conversation in a couple of years, there's going to be things that we know that we don't yet know, which is really exciting. Yeah. So may I be able to persuade you both to come back in the future and talk about what's changed in your understanding and, and what Absolutely, we know. Yeah. Now? I really. Yeah. I mean, at the network, we, we just, love talking to people um, as you can tell it's a huge passion for both of us and um, you know we, we think collaboration is, is key really and we're happy to talk with people in, in different areas to get our message out and support anybody that is having maths difficulties and if there are other specialists in dyscalculia who'd like to become part of your network how do they approach you if, well, they can contact us directly via our social media channels or directly through the website. Um, there's a direct link from the website to join up. Um, obviously, we're very uh, careful that uh, we check all of the people that apply to join the network um, because it's important that you know we have true math specialists with us on the network. Um, so we vet anyone that joins. Um, and we'll get back to them, you know, even if it's not quite appropriate yet, yeah, we'll support them into, if they're keen, we'll support them in their development in terms of training and, and stuff until they become the specialists that we're, we're looking for. Thank you. And is it just a UK based network or do you have people outside the UK as well? Well, we, we, set, we set up originally to be UK, but we've got people from all over the world contacting us, I think. In, um, uh, social media and the internet is a truly global um, communications network and uh, we, we're working with people from uh, Canada, the west coast of the states and all over basically so it wasn't intended to be but it is truly an international network. Okay thank you both so much for your time today I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Pleasure.